I'm certainly not for war and in favor of war and all those kind of things at all whatsoever. Please don't misunderstand me. But in difficult times and difficult situations, people turn to the Lord. And it seems to be that's the case of what's happening in Ukraine. And we heard that not only in that letter from Christopher Rue, but also in our conversation with Brother Richard Mayer, who's also our missionary in Ukraine last week, and he even texted me this week as well. He's not in Ukraine right now, but he has been in and out. He has been duplicating those stories of so many people. He, he said it's amazing that they do need the physical aid and the physical help, but he said sometimes they will ask for the literature before they ask for the food. And so I, I certainly am not advocating war in America, but I do oftentimes wonder if that's what it's going to take before America sees its need for a Savior or sees its need for God once again. What a blessing that folks in those countries, I, I hate what's happened there. And, uh, every, every family, my wife was telling me, and one of the missionary wives at the missions conference last week, Brother Mayor's wife was speaking, and she said absolutely every family there has been affected in one way or the other by the war. They've all suffered loss. And so I'm thankful that we as a church have a small part in being able to help those missionaries to get in and out of the country, share the gospel with those people, and see people saved. And uh, that's a great blessing. And so I'm thankful for men who's willing to do that. I'm thankful for a church that's willing to support missionaries. And I know we've taken up quite a bit of time on a Wednesday afternoon but that letter was helpful and encouraging to me, and I hope it was to you as well, give you just a little bit of, of um, idea of what's going on in that country. And they are, there's still war going on there. I, I'm not a news junkie. I don't know what is being uh, aired on the news. I, I really have no idea at all. But I do know that um, you grow weary and grow tired of things, and they move on. And I think Ukraine has lost some of the new support that they were receiving. But all of our missionaries and people that I know in that region, even in Moldova and in Poland, there is still a serious war going on in Ukraine. And so be much in prayer for those, those people, if you will, and for those missionaries who are working there. What a blessing. All right, we are returning this afternoon. I have a couple more lessons in Bible terminology that I, I hate to not include. So I'll mention some things this afternoon and probably maybe again next Wednesday and complete all that I'd like to say from this Bible terminology uh, list. I'll be brief in some of the things that we are going to talk about, but I do think that they're important and hate to just leave them. And so we're at Bible Doctrine number 73, and we're talking about the second coming. So we'll talk about that in just a moment, just, just briefly. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for our missionaries. Thank you for the good report that we received in the letter from Brother Rue. And the Lord, he's a wonderful missionary. He and Brother Mayor, both that we support over there, are some of the best missionaries that I know. And I'm very, very thankful that our church has a small part in being, uh, supporting them and laboring together with them. And I, I thank you, Lord, uh, for their work there. And I pray for the people of Ukraine and for the missionaries all around the world, not just the many missionaries that we support, many missionaries we don't support that I wish we could. And uh, Lord, there's just so many people who are working and laboring in other places around the world uh, serving the Lord. We're thankful for them. Please keep your hand upon them. Please protect them. Please watch over them, take care of them. And please continue to use them to win souls to Christ. Lord, would you help us for just a few moments to be a blessing and encouragement to your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I was going to mention one, one thing. I'll do that quickly, and I'll get on uh, with it. But what about that uh, missile that fell through that man's house three feet from where they were sleeping, and it did not detonate? I'd say he had something to praise the Lord for the next day. Man, what a, what a blessing. All right, the term second coming is not found anywhere in the Bible. The second coming of Christ is a prophetic event which will occur 
uh, in the very near future. Uh, just as Jesus came the first time as a literal, physical, visible person, he will come likewise the second time as well. And although some teach that the second coming is not a literal event, the Bible states very clearly that it is. Uh, when Jesus came the first time, he came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. You read about that in John chapter 1, verse 29. But the second time, he is coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah and as the King of kings, according to Revelation chapter 5, verse number 5, and Revelation 19, verse 16. In Matthew chapter 4, when uh, he was led up in the mountain and tempted by Satan, he turned down the kingdoms of the world at that time. But he will take full control of those kingdoms when he returns. Let me read this to you. You can turn there if you'd like. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter number 11. And verse 15. The Bible says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So he turned those kingdoms down, but one of these days the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord. Now the Old Testament is filled with prophecies about the Lord establishing a righteous kingdom upon earth, with Israel being the head of these nations. There are many, many places that we could read. I have several different places uh, uh, referenced in my notes. I'm not even going to try to read all of those. I will read a couple. Come to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23 and Isaiah chapter 2. And I'll remind you as you're turning there <coughs> that the Old Testament is filled with prophecies about the Lord establishing a righteous kingdom upon the earth with Israel being the head of all nations. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23, and then I'll read from Isaiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse number 5, the Bible says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Now, I'll mention this again in a moment, but it is evident that this has not happened yet, so this is certainly future, and this is obviously some scripture in reference to what will be taking place during the millennium. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 2. He is, the Lord is going to rule and reign from David's throne in Israel. And he's going, there's going to be a righteous king. Amen. What a blessing. And he shall execute judgment in the earth. Now, Isaiah chapter 2, we'll read this again, verse number 1. The Bible says, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. There is war and rumors of war now. Even in Israel, there's war all around them and many others wanting to go to war with them. But one of these days, one of these days, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be in complete control and he's going to have charge of all the kingdoms of this earth and there isn't going to be war anymore. Amen. Look at Zechariah chapter 14. We'll read one more, one more little passage here and we'll move on. Zechariah chapter 14. And we'll begin reading in verse number 16. Just go to the division of the Old and New Testament. Turn backwards just a couple of pages. Zechariah chapter 14. Verse number 16 says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem 
shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not and have no rain, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bales of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And they and all they that sacrifice shall come and take them and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. And so there is coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be worshipped. And if he's not going to be worshipped, if you're not going to worship him, you're going to suffer because of your refusal to worship the Lord. Now, these prophecies that were mentioned, they were not fulfilled at Christ's first coming. And so they will be fulfilled when he comes again. I know that there are many who teach that these prophecies are no longer in effect because the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as their king, but that is certainly not true. All of these prophecies and many more like them are still in effect. Uh, come, to, come to Luke chapter 1, and they will be fulfilled when Jesus returns. Now, look at this. In Luke chapter 1, notice what the... Huh, I have a... Typo. Notice what the angel, I put angle, notice what the angel Mary said uh, concerning the earthly birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this in Luke uh, chapter number 1, the prophecy concerning the birth of the Lord. The Bible says in verse number 30, Luke chapter 1, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Now look at verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now we certainly believe the first part of that. We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. We believe that the virgin conceived in her womb. She brought forth a son. His name is Jesus. He's the son of the highest. And we believe all of that. Why can we not believe that the throne of his father David is going to be given unto him and that he is going to um, reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom? There shall be no end. What a blessing. Now come to Romans, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, and I'll begin reading in verse number 8. The Bible says, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And so there are certainly some great prophecies concerning the Lord and his future reign and future kingdom on this earth. I'm glad the Lord is coming. 
Now, there are many other prophecies in the New Testament that prove that as well. And I commissioned several, uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Acts 15, uh, 14 through 16, Romans 11, 20, verses 25 and 26, Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 19. And um, these and many other places in the Bible, we can certainly see that God has not forgotten about these second coming prophecies. It's God's will for His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to rule over the earth in righteousness and for 6,000 years, man has been in control of this thing. Man has done nothing but make a mess. And uh, man has certainly proven that he is totally incapable of establishing peace and righteousness upon the earth. But at the second coming, God will take control, amen, and we will have a reign of peace and righteousness with the Lord. Now, before, and you guys know all of this, but it's in my notes, I'll mention it. Before the actual second coming or the second advent, Jesus will return for the church, call out those who are saved. The earth will then enter the tribulation, which will be approximately seven years in length. At the end of the great tribulation, the Lord Jesus Christ will return from heaven with his saints and take over the kingdoms of the world. The wicked will be destroyed, the millennial kingdom will be established. And God's Son will rule the nations, and you and I who are born again will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's Bible Doctrine 73, second coming, and that was quick, amen. Bible Doctrine 74, something we won't spend a lot of time on, and that is sinner. Uh, the term sinner or sinners is found 69 times in 67 verses in the Bible, some have the idea that a sinner is someone who is extremely wicked or ungodly or does something that they wouldn't do, whatever the case may be. But I'll, I, And that's true, they are. But uh, it's not just a certain group of people. All of us are actually classified as sinners. See, ma'am, the Bible declares for all to sin and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. And so we're all sinners, we're all sinful, and we all need to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. I'm glad that the Lord Jesus Christ came to die for the sins of all mankind because all of us are sinners and all of us are in need of a Savior, and I'm thankful for our Savior that came to save us from our sins. All right, come find in your Bible two places, Leviticus chapter 18 and Romans chapter 1. We'll talk about Bible doctrine number 75, Leviticus chapter 18, Romans chapter 1. Some of you are following along in the S's. You already know what we're going to mention. I hate to even mention the word, but we're going to talk about sodomites. Bible doctrine number 75 is sodomite. The term sodomite or sodomites is found five times in five verses in our King James Bible. The Bible has a lot to say about sodomy. I will not read all the verses. I will not go into great detail other than to read what the Bible has to say about it. But we are living in a wicked and perverse land, a wicked and perverse nation. And this is some wickedness that is rampant in our day and time. God has always been against it. He's not changed his mind. He's still against it, amen. Leviticus 18, verse 22. Look what the Bible says. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination. Now turn over just probably a page to Leviticus chapter 20, and we'll read one more verse before we go to Romans chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, the Bible says, If a man shall lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And so we see that God is against Sodom. Can I say something just because I thought about it as I was passing by? If you go back up to verse number 10, you know the Lord said the same thing about an adulterer in verse number 10 as he said about a sodomite in verse number 13. And so years ago, years ago, our, our country, our nation, seemingly the world as a whole, uh, accepted a, a adultery and all that kind of stuff and no big deal. Let's just move on and get on with it. God said that was an abomination, just like he says sodomites are an abomination. And both of those are still an abomination in the sight of God. And just because our nation has accepted one and they're in the process of accepting another, doesn't mean God's accepted either one of them. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. By the way, I don't have it here in my notes, but it's also in Romans chapter 1 as well, if I remember correctly, concerning adultery. 
Romans Romans chapter 1, look at verse 26. The Bible says, For this cause God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their herb which was meat. And so God is against it. It's an abomination to God. It will be judged. Now, we're not going to go there, but in Genesis chapter 19, God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sin of sodomy. I thought this was interesting. I, I read all these today. I'll give you these. I'm not going to go to them and read them. But there's three places in 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 24, chapter 15, and verse number 12. In chapter 22, verse number 26, or verse number 46, chapter 22, verse 46, in all three of those first Kings passages, the Sodomites were taken out of the land. But unfortunately, in the, in the land which you and I live in, and other places around the world as well, not just in America, these Sodomites are, have become celebrities. They, they, they're being promoted. They're being praised. They're being exalted, if you will. And instead of being, well, I hate to use the term removed. They need to be saved, amen. They need to be born again, and they'll get out of that sin of wickedness and ungodliness. God has never created anyone to be a sex pervert. He has never approved of this sin. Amen. All right, come to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Bible doctrine number 76 is spiritual circumcision. This is something we can rejoice about, amen. Spiritual circumcision. Colossians chapter 2, the term spiritual circumcision is referred to in this passage of Scripture. I'll read verses number 10 down through verse, uh, probably down through verse 15. The verse number 11 is where we see this. But I'll give you some context. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 10, and ye are complete in him. That's good enough right there. I'm in Christ, he's in me, I'm complete. What a blessing. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. What is that? And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are raised with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show, a show of them openly, triumphantly over them in it. And so this term, this spiritual circumcision, it's a term, the term is when the new believer experiences this circumcision made without hands that we mentioned in verse number 11. And it said the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And so what happened was when we got saved, we didn't know it, but God performed a surgery, amen, and he cut this body of flesh away from our, our spirit and soul. What a blessing it is. It was a circumcision made without hands. And it puts off this body of sins and allows the Christian to serve God in the spirit. I guess we could put it in practical terms. You could put it like this. The Christian's body is cut loose from this corruptible or the Christian's soul is cut loose from this, uh, this corruptible body of flesh that you and I have. And it is not hindering this redeemed soul that we have within. What a blessing it is to be redeemed. Amen. Come to Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter twelve. Bible doctrine number seventy-seven. I am putting up with this flesh, but one of these days I am going to get a new body. Amen. One that is incorruptible and immoral. One like unto the Son of God. Brother Michael and I was talking about that Sunday afternoon. I don't know how to explain all that. I just believe it. Amen. I can't, I can't tell you how all that's going to be. I just know that I'm not going to have any trouble with this flesh anymore one of these days. 
and uh, it's going to be a great thing to be likened unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't tell you exactly what that is. I just know it's going to be so because the Bible says it is. Okay, stewardship. Bible doctrine number 77 is stewardship. The word or the term steward or stewards or stewardship is found 20 times in 20 verses in the Bible. A steward is one who is given the responsibility of managing the or overseeing something that belongs to another. And there are several passages that we could read concerning this topic. I'll mention some of those passages, but we'll read only one. Genesis chapter 15, you can read about that. You can also read about in Luke chapter 16, the first part of Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. And I want to read Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we'll talk about this steward. The Bible says in verse number 42, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, who his Lord shall make him ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delay this coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maid servants, and to eat and to drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in, a, in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew the Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. And so may the Lord help you and I to be wise stewards about the Father's business. God has made every single believer, every Christian, a steward according to, you don't have to turn there, I will, 1 Peter chapter 4. You're welcome to turn there if you'd like to. 1 Peter chapter 4. God has made every Christian a steward according to this passage. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You see, the truth is, if you've been born again, you belong to the Lord. You belong to, the Lord. You belong to God. He, he has bought you. He has purchased you. You are no longer your own. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We use these verses of Scripture to try to get people to uh, present themselves in the right fashion. They ought to dress right. And uh, they ought to glorify God in their body. I'll tell you, I'll just tell you like this. I ain't going to make no bones about it. You get your heart right, you'll put clothes on. It's a heart matter. It's just like giving. You don't, you don't have to beg somebody to give whose heart's right with the Lord. You don't have to beg somebody to witness whose heart's right with God. You don't have to beg somebody to dress right for heart's right with God. It's a heart issue. Yeah, you're welcome. That was free. First Corinthians 6, 19. Look, what? What? Question. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. That's pretty clear. I mean, he didn't mince any words. You didn't have to go learn Greek to figure out what that meant. You, don't even, you probably don't even have to have an uh, elementary education to know what that means. It's pretty simple. If it's not simple enough, he, he clarifies it even more in the next verse where you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So it's very clear from this passage of Scripture that if we've been born again, He owns us. And so if He owns us, He owns everything that we own. Now, with that being true, with that being a factual statement, it is our duty to properly manage our entire life for the glory of God. We are stewards of the life that God has given us. And so may the Lord help us to be wise stewards of our own bodies. We should give, manage our entire life according to his will. Now, I don't know who said this. I wish I did. I would, I would let you know. But someone has wisely said this. We need to be good stewards with our time, with our talents, and with our treasure because we will give an account to God for it all. That is very true. God help us. Come to Matthew chapter 23.
Matthew chapter 23, talk about the Bible doctrine of tithing. Some of you got really scared right there, but just hear me out, please. Matthew chapter 23, the term tithe, tithes, or tithing is found 40 times in 32 verses in our King James Bible. And to tithe is to give a tenth. Uh, the first occurrence of tithing in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 14, verse number 20, where Abraham gave God a tenth of all of his possessions. Jacob also vows to tithe in Genesis chapter 28. Uh, there's something that we can learn by application there, and that is parents, you should give and teach your children to give. Uh, tithing was also a requirement under the Mosaic Law, Leviticus 27, Numbers 18, Deuteronomy chapter 14. A tenth of all income was to be given over to the Levitical priesthood for their living and for the maintenance of the Lord's service. The blessings of God were promised to those who were obedient to his laws of tithing in, Matthew, and in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Now, I am fully aware that the New Testament Bible-believing Christians are encouraged to be givers, and I'll say more about that in a moment. However, I do want to point out that tithing was practiced and God accepted tithes long before the law of Moses. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, what I want to read, Jesus even upheld tithing during his public ministry. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 23 and verse number 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe and mint and nice and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done, you ought to have paid your tithes, and not to leave these other, or, and not to leave the other undone. So with that truth in mind, I want you to think about this. If the Old Testament Jew, whose sins had not yet been paid for, can give a tenth of his income to the Lord, how much more should we be willing to give who have had our sins forgiven, amen. They've not just been forgiven, they've been washed away by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, come to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As New Testament Bible-believing Christians, we stress the importance of giving over the command of Old Testament tithing. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. You guys are a giving church. This is not a reprimand. This is an encouragement to continue to faithfully give to the work of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he has purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And so we see in this passage, we see the law of sowing and reaping is evident in this passage. And uh, if you sow a little, you reap a little. If you sow a lot, you reap a lot. That's evident in the passage. You, you can believe it or not. It's up to you. Amen. I'll, I'll just say this. You cannot outgive God. It is absolutely impossible to outgive God. Now, so also we see in this passage that it's very clear that God loves a cheerful giver. I hope when, when the time rolls around for you to give, whether it's on every week or biweekly or monthly, however it's set up, I hope you don't say, man, look how much more money I could have if I didn't have to. Don't give grudgingly. You know, you know I, I, I often I, I praise the Lord that I have the privilege and the opportunity to be able to give. It is a blessing to be able to give to the work of the Lord. Now, we, we, we're talking a lot about tithing, but most Bible-believing churches consider tithing to be a minimum gift. You're welcome. That's a good place to start. It's a good place to start. <laughs> I agree with you, preacher. It's a good place to start. That's where I started. Amen. Been saved a while. I hope you're giving way beyond a minimum. Amen. Now, usually the what's considered a tithe is used for the general expenses of the church to keep things going, keep things running, and uh, the missionary giving offerings all considered separate altogether. These give these things are given as man purpose in his heart. Listen, if your heart has no purpose, your wallet will remain stale and frosty and rotten 
and sour. And what I mean, molded is the word I'm looking for. Finally thought of it after I mentioned all those other things. So if you have no purpose in your heart, then there's, you know. Now listen, I don't think it's a stretch at all. I don't think it's a stretch at all to say that giving is a heart issue. As a man purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Uh, let's get one more. Come to First John chapter five. We'll look at. We don't want to end on that, man. Some of you, you won't get over that till next year. It's a good thing next year's not too far away. So let's let's move on to something else here. Bad doctor number seventy nine is the Trinity. Now the term Trinity is not found anywhere in our King James Bible either. Just like the Rapture isn't, or the Second Coming isn't, although they're just as true. Uh, the Trinity doctrine is the doctrine that God consists of three distinct persons. We know that to be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Those who deny the existence of the Trinity usually do so because they can't understand it. And the thing about that is those of us who accept the Trinity doctrine don't fully understand it either. We just believe what God said in His Word, amen. Now, what, what did He say about it? Well, that's why I asked you to come to 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7. And if you have a King James Bible, you can read along with me. If you have some other perversion of the Scripture, you won't find this. But 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father. Now notice that the Word, it's capital. Anytime the Bible speaks of the Word of God, it is not capitalized. But when the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the Word, it is capitalized. And so the Word is the Son. And then the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's pretty clear, pretty plain that there are three and they are one. Come to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19. This is the Great Commission verse. The Trinity is named for us in this passage of Scripture. Matthew 28, verse number 19. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And so there we see the Trinity again. I want to ask you to turn to all these places. You can go to Matthew chapter 3 if you want. We'll read something there in just a moment. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 14, the Bible says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So we see also the Trinity in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Now look at Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, all three members of the Holy Trinity are present at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 3, look at verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying... I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove, and lightning upon him, the Lord Jesus Christ, and lo, a voice from heaven, that would be God, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So we see the Trinity in the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also, Jesus said, when you've seen him, you've seen the Father, John 14, 9. Peter said that when you lie to the Holy Ghost, you're lying to God in Acts chapter 5, speaking of Ananias and Sapphira. And this, listen, this is the conclusion. God the Father is God, God the Son is God, and God the Holy Ghost is God. And you can see the Trinity it is, is everywhere. God is the Trinity, three and one, one and three. And one in the middle died for me. It's the Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for the Bible, the opportunity to look at a few things in Scripture this evening. I'm thankful, Lord, that you have so freely and willingly given your life for us. Help us, Lord, to be willing to give our life for you. Help us, Lord, to not be so selfish that we have no time for God, no thought for the things of God. And, Lord, we are, our flesh is wicked. We're living in a wicked world. There is temptation on every side. And, Lord, help us to stay true to you and your word, we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. All right, we'll get a prayer can name here in just a moment.